Well, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Gary Lucas uh, here to present to you the 2018 booster pack that is designed to supplement our rural and community health uh, online certification training programs. And uh, the, the intent here is to kind of outline some of the changes that were going into effect uh, throughout the course of 2018, both from the CPT, HICPICS, and ICD-10 coding perspective, but also some of the billing issues that uh, are going into effect at this time that are going to impact the way you turn your valuable services into compliant revenue, trying to make sure you get every dollar you're entitled to but not any more than you're allowed. So what you'll notice here is we will be doing a split screen where you see me on one side and then uh, on the other side of the screen, you're gonna see either my presentation or you're gonna see the internet uh, because we're gonna show you some resources and websites that you also probably wanna keep up with on a regular basis. If you have not already at this time, already gone to the resources uh, button before you launched this course, now would be the time to stop this video, close the window out, and go back to where you launched the video and notice and look in the left-hand margin uh, that you'll be able to locate uh, the resources button. And so one of the things you're also gonna see is that I'll be able to circle some key things on those slides that we would encourage you to highlight if you choose to print those slides out as well. Uh, there are about 60 slides, give or take, in the presentation, and you can always print those about two per page, front and back of the page to save uh, in some of your printing costs. So uh, again, you'll see the resources button located over there for you. And the uh, intent of this is to update those of you that purchased the uh, online coding and billing certification course. And really the majority of the changes that took place in 2018 are in some CPT and some HICPICS codes and with some new care plan uh, and care management services. Some of you may just be watching this individually as a, a standalone uh, because you've already taken our in-person version of these coding and documentation boot camps. And then you, of course, then have the billing webinars and you can take our optional certification exam. And I'll touch on a little bit of that at the very end of this video. So uh, if you did wanna see a sneak peek or maybe you weren't even aware that there's an option for those of you in rural health clinics, small rural hospitals, and community health centers or FQHCs, if you didn't even know there was an option out there for you to get certified, maybe learn more to earn more, you can go take a look and look at a sneak peek of our uh, kind of the 40 minute introductory module where we explain the self-study approach and uh, kind of the unique uh, realm of rural health and community health documentation, coding and billing. It's a little bit different than those providers that are traditionally reporting their services to Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurance. We certainly have some very unique things in our field. And uh, you know the general organization of the course does not require you to take the booster pack at the beginning or, or you know, uh, anywhere in particular in the course, but we really think you should focus probably somewhere maybe between sections one and two or maybe right around section three uh, to watch this video. Uh, for those of you that may choose to get the certification online version after this, of course, uh, we wanted to make sure that if there were some changes, you knew uh, uh, how it fits into the overall course. So, you know, showing you a little bit here about what the contents of the course are and getting into a bit more detail about what each section entails is going to be in that sneak peek video that's available for free on YouTube. Uh, so here's my contact information. My name is Gary Lucas. I serve as Vice President of Education Operations for the Association for Rural and Community Health Professional Coding. We're based out of Metro Atlanta, but we have colleagues and, and staff kind of spread out all across the country. You have my phone number and email address. If I can be of any assistance, I'll get into a little bit later of the distinction between our member center and our e-learning center uh, at the very end, just in case you're looking for any follow-up information after this course. So before we get started, just a few disclaimers. Uh, of course, you're responsible for all code selections. We're providing you general advice and consultation regarding our interpretation of coding guidelines and documentation rules, and then how they bridge to the Medicare billing world. And uh, really, really wanna be sure that you're working closely together with your providers, 
who actually create the documentation, uh, that you work closely with management, who determines who's going to capture the documentation in the proper codes, and then to, of course, the coders and billers that are going to submit those claims out. You're going to see me put some various regulatory guidance uh, and hyperlinks in this presentation. Uh, as you know uh, very well, uh, once you get this industry down, they could change it tomorrow. So please always be sure to double check and see if any of those hyperlinks have been updated, or more importantly, if any of the resources themselves have been updated. So welcome to the 2018 Booster Pack. Let's go ahead and jump in to highlights of the CPT, HICPIX Level 2, and ICD-10 CM coding updates, those that affect rural health clinics, small rural hospitals that own clinics, and community health centers, also known as FQHCs. So when we talk about updating documents, you see here uh, uh, over on the other screen how, how uh, important uh, Medicare is in creating billing rules and regulations that a lot of other carriers tend to follow, but do not automatically follow. So you'll see the two main resources over here, Chapter 9 from the Medicare Claims Manual, and chapter 13 from the Medicare Benefit Manual. And please note very carefully that that was revised here a couple weeks ago. We're near the end of January. A lot of these changes have gone into effect. And this document that was last updated three or four years ago recently got some changes. Those changes we'll go uh, into more detail on in our billing webinars that are at the end of the certification bootcamp. But I'm gonna make sure to give you the highlights and the same resources that we provide in those online certification modules. You'll notice over here in each document, whether it was updated a couple of years ago or a couple of weeks ago, that any items that are in red text uh, identify any new text that's added. And there on the very bottom of the uh, Medicare Benefit Policy Manual in chapter 13, you start seeing some red text around those words care management services. Uh, so some changes in your 2018 CPT, along with your 2018 HICPICS Level 2 Codebook, really go hand in hand with those updates that went into effect last week, and they impact every rural health and community health center in the country. And we'll make sure to get you links to that and make sure you get updated. But it's vital to remember that if we're going to talk about billing, we have to fall back to Medicare because yes, as Medicare goes, other carriers tend to follow. But as you see this here, remember folks that Medicaid is very different state by state. Even within one state, we're located in Georgia, but even here we have multiple Medicaid, Medicaid managed care plans that may have their own billing rules. And you're not gonna always get those from Medicare. So the idea that we have to you know, charge everybody the same is not factually correct. We, or let me rephrase that. We, the fact that we have to bill everybody the same is not correct. Our charges are the same for everybody, no matter what kind of insurance they have. We agree, however, to a, maybe a reduction in those fees and agree to abide by the guidelines in the participation rules for Medicaid, and they could be completely different. So if we're talking billing here, we're talking Medicare only, please confirm with your Medicaid carriers and your commercial insurance companies to see how they interpret these rules because we will find that Medicare does not want, as of 2018, the CPT's care management and coordination of care, chronic care management codes. They want their own HICPICS code. So you actually might have Medicaid and commercial insurance want a CPT code, and you may want Medicare to report and see a various other code. So that's kind of where we're at here. And the main document that kind of highlights a lot of these changes, you notice came out January 9th. Although you see the website there at the very bottom, uh, we realize that if you're watching this on video, if you just look at the screen and were to Google those words, or more importantly, this number here, MedLearn Matters, coming from CMS, from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that their MedLearn Matters came out that was revised that actually sped up the implementation date of these changes that were supposed to take place uh, mid-February and sped them up to January. So you want to make sure that in addition to uh, going to Medicare sites that you use us and your state and national associations to keep up to date with any of these changes because sometimes 
although we've been used to seeing delays in the industry, they actually sped up on implementation here. We'll tell you how to get in touch with us on Facebook and, and, and get some of these updates as we move forward. But this uh, obviously is focused on rural health and FQHCs, and you'll see Medicare do that a lot. They tend to group rural health and federally qualified health centers together. Again, FQHC and community health centers. We're gonna use interchangeably, identifying that both of these organizations have already gone through the certification and credentialing process to be designated a rural health clinic and a community health clinic, which automatically bumps them into these new and updated rules uh, that we're gonna be touching on. Although they tend to write the rules in the same documents, you will sometimes see a minor little change in how Medicare wants a rural health clinic to bill it versus FQHC. So please pay particular attention to that if and when you're able to go review these documents in full. We're not here to review every paragraph or every page. My job in this video is to let you know where the changes are, what the highlights are, but nothing really substitutes for going and reading and having access to the full documents themselves. We recommend you keep those in a three ring binder. And as a matter of fact, one of the benefits of our online certification class is the fact that you finish that class, not only getting the same education you get in our in-person training classes, but you build a pretty thick three ring binder full of Medicare source reference information. So the transmittals referenced on this slide uh, were updated. And then the main link over here is to the full transmittal that highlights the changes related to care management, behavioral health integration, uh, chronic care management services, and what, are, what they're calling psychiatric a psychiatric, excuse me, collaborative care models. And let me show you what that looks like. And that's kind of one of the benefits of uh, taking this approach here. If you'll bear with me a brief moment, uh, I wanted to show you what these documents look like. And I've kind of pulled them up on the internet for you. So there's the uh, transmittal you saw the screenshot for. And here is the full document for Medicare. And what you may notice there at the very top is it's a 41 page document. But if you have reviewed the previous version of this document, your main focus is to really locate and identify any of those changes that occur in red. And so realizing you're not gonna be able to read this as I completely scroll through it, uh, I just will point out that the effective dates and the background of this information is gonna continually be brought to you. And that in addition to that kind of initial table of contents type stuff, you get a background of what's added and what was revised in this manual. It gives you a nice listing of different acronyms that are out there, as you have noticed by now. Even if you've only been in this industry a little bit of time, uh, a lot of uh, acronyms and abbreviations in this industry. And so if you ever wanted to provide source information on general FQHC guidelines or some of these specific rules, this is the kind of stuff uh, you're really gonna wanna go look at. And so. Uh, whether it's staffing requirements, credentialing requirements, or what we're focused on billing, I wanted to make sure that you knew uh, what that looked like and that you knew where to go get the information. So in addition to those changes, I, I put a sentence here on the very bottom that I found really interesting in, in, in Medicare's release. And it says, all other revisions serve to clarify existing policy. Well, my question is how well do you know that existing policy? Those aren't easy documents to read, and we hope we're able to provide a little guidance and help there. Uh, but to take that 41-page document, what we've done is outline which section might be important for you so you don't have to scan each one if you've already read the full guidance here. So uh, in particular, there are two new terms that are defined for rural and community health this year. They are in the middle of the screen. They're one, behavioral health integration, and to a collaborative care model. These are terms that maybe have been in the industry before, but have just now been adopted as it relates to rural and community health billing and coding. And one interesting thing you may notice there is that for both rural health and FQHC, those types of services and some of those new G codes we'll look at are not always reimbursed under a rural health clinic's all-inclusive rate and are not always reimbursed under a community health center's PPS rate, that prospective payment system rate, kind of that daily per diem rate, just like a rural health clinic's all-inclusive rate, AIR. 
Some of these services are gonna actually uh, be reimbursed or paid fee for service. Sometimes the patients will have no coinsurance or deductible. Sometimes one or the other is waived. And if you'll notice, uh, we'll be uh, providing that information to you. Here are the four main types of updates that went into effect on uh, the first week of uh, January there. Uh, and you'll notice some familiar friends there like transitional care management, talking about how you're taking care of patients within the first month about of when they've been released from an inpatient facility and how they're transitioned into ongoing care at a clinic location to hopefully reduce uh, repeat admissions, etc. Uh, you'll hear things about chronic care management. These have been pretty popular subjects over the last couple years where they've updated which codes they want to use. And we'll provide some highlights here. But one thing they also did very nicely in that billing manual is they confirmed and clarified in the Medicare documentation that there are numerous scenarios where you're able to get more than one daily rate per day. And so they've clarified how you would report this, but notice at the bottom that it's a little different on a rural health claim than it is on an FQHC claim. So let's say you have a patient come in in the morning, they're there for their standard diabetes visit. You perform that service. It's a qualifying visit by a qualified provider in an authorized location and you're gonna end up having your office visit and maybe some minor procedures and lab tests and all that uh, ready to go out on various claims. However, four hours later, the patient trips, falls, severely hurts their hip or their knee, separate injury, same day comes back to see that same or another provider. In that case, you are gonna be authorized to report both services, likely under evaluation and management codes, on the same claim based on the billing guidance that we give in our billing webinars. Uh, but rural health clinics are gonna to wanna to put either a 25 modifier or a 59 modifier on that second evaluation and management service. Whereas for FQHCs, you're only supposed to put a modifier 59 on that second ENM service. Now, uh, that's a great highlight of a difference between what the CPT rules are and what the billing rules are. As always, by the way, anytime we hold up a CPT, all CPTs are owned and registered trademarks and copyrighted by the American Medical Association. All codes, uh, services, and so forth are owned by them. We wanna make sure we give appropriate credit. Um, but one of the things you'll see in the very back of the book in the CPT is Appendix A, and it's where you're gonna see modifiers listed. And, and you know, a lot of times on a practices encounter form or super bill, uh, you won't have the full definition of the code or you won't have the full modifier definition there. And, you know, one of the things we really focus on in our first module of our certification classes, whether it's, you know, in person or online, is that there's a difference in coding and documentation rules which are only found in the AMA CPT, uh, honestly not in other publishers' books. It's gotta be an AMA CPT. Uh, and a difference in how that code is reported on a claim. So for example, with modifier 59, we talk extensively about this modifier in our uh, normal training classes. Uh, and it says three, maybe even four times in the definition of modifier 59 to not use it on an evaluation and management code. Well, that's a coding guideline. Once you transition to billing, y'all, it's gonna be important to recognize that they may want you to do something that doesn't make sense to a certified coder because most certified coder credentials don't have anything to do with billing. They're purely coding credentials. It's a little unique about ours as we include the billing aspect. And, and that's why the first module in our training classes is really separating documentation from coding and separating that from billing. So you may see some, some issues and of course some more, uh, uh, you know, drawn out appropriately uh, explanations of some of the exceptions when you can generate more than two per diem rates per patient. As we continue going through that guideline in that revision of that transmittal 239 that went into effect the first week of January, you'll notice here there's a little clarity. It says RHCs and FQHCs must submit claims for RHC or FQHC service 
under the Rural Health Clinic or FQHC payment methodologies notice, it says, and are not authorized to submit claims under the PFS, which is Physician Fee Schedule for Rural Health or FQHC services. Little bit uh, understandably confusing here. Uh, we spent a lot of time in our, our, our full classes talking about the distinction and difference between what a, an RHC or FQHC service is and a non-rural health clinic or non-FQHC service. That little sentence has come up a few times when we see providers in either one of those locations and they say, wait a minute, we've been told we're not allowed to bill for, for example, hospital visits. If your provider is located close enough to an inpatient facility, like a hospital, and they go visit their patient, that's a non-rural health or non-FQHC service because it didn't take place on-site in that clinic. It took place in a hospital setting. But you can bill that fee-for-service to Medicare Part B as a rural health provider, as an FQHC provider, but it goes out on a Part B claim form that CMS 1500 form. Now, of course, we get into more details in the full training classes there, but by the way, there are uh, other locations where a rural health or community health provider can actually bill for a rural health or community health center service when it was done outside of the office setting. That's why we think our training classes are vitally important. One example of that would be the scene of an accident. So little side note there, to be very careful to make sure you're processing some services through the traditional Medicare billing rules for our types of facilities, but knowing when you may bill for non-rural health or non-FQHC services, but still get reimbursed for them separately. Obviously, Medicare appropriately wants to make sure you're not getting paid for something twice or that by changing where the claim goes or what type of claim for you use that you're getting more money. So I think this is a good clarification. This would be an easy sentence to slip up and, 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 and either misunderstand, but, but I tell you right now, by clarifying what we talk about here in some of the uh, trainings that we do. We've helped facilities get paid for things they didn't think they could bill for. And so I wanted to give you that section where a little bit more detail is provided uh, so that you didn't have to maybe read the whole document. The next uh, main update for 2018, again, the source is on the bottom, but since you're watching this on video, it might be easier to just uh, uh, Google or do a Bing search on the care coordination services and payment uh, for these organizations. Notice the effective date of these were January 1st. And again, as they always point out, if it was revised, in this case, instead of putting new items in red, uh, items that have been revised uh, or updated here are in bold text. Uh, so that new phrase, as far as the Medicare billing world uh, is concerned, deals with behavioral health integration services. And so that's obviously one of the challenges in underserved areas, whether it's a rural or urban underserved area. Uh, it's going to be important to recognize that, you know, the continued and ongoing efforts to unify medical care and mental health care together uh, is, is, is really important, and the ability to uh, train, uh, retrain, and retain providers, especially psychiatric professionals in a rural or urban shortage area, has always been kind of tough. And so I think they're appropriately, in my opinion, um, identifying opportunities from us to get paid for things that you may have done already in the best interest of your patients, but there weren't codes prior to this year that were specific enough to us to help us get paid. And as you see here at the very bottom, there are four new Medicare Part B billing codes that you and I are going to use. And I've got to stop right there because please notice that it says the target audience for this particular document are traditional fee-for-service providers, which most likely is not uh, uh, where you're working. It's vital to realize that although you and I in a rural health and a community health center build the majority of our covered claims on a form associated with Part A Medicare, that CMS 1450 form or the old UB form, that although we bill on that form primarily, we are Part B Medicare providers. 
You have to have Medicare Part B insurance to have coverage in a rural health clinic or an FQHC to receive the payment here. So we do want you to be conscious of, of uh, the fact that we are Part B providers, not Part A in a rural health clinic and in an FQHC. So here are a couple codes here. I want to give you the highlights. I'm not going to read slides to you. We assume that the pause button is your best friend for this video and that you may occasionally need to pause me and go look at one of these documents, read for your own, and then come back together. But in particular, chronic care management's a topic that's been out for us for a few years. And you'll see at the top there, there are two new codes in particular to report chronic care management, not using the CPT codes that were created a couple years ago. Medicare has created their own codes, effective January 2015, first G0511 or G0512. And so effective January 1 of 2018, you can receive payment in a rural health clinic or an FQHC for either chronic care management or general behavioral health integration services as long as you meet that threshold of 20 minutes per calendar month. Um, very important that we recognize that this is not just for services provided by our main providers, our MDs and DOs and PAs and MPs. This could be the work of a, of a nurse, somebody in that office that is not used to reporting their services that although they document them in the medical record, like a nurse visit, they don't traditionally get billed out as a reimbursable service. These are the services provided in between usually patient visits that add up each month. These are services patients don't often realize that we're providing. And as of 2016 and 2017, for the most part, this was something that rural health and FQHCs would bill and get fee for service on when done in their office. And so the code we had used in the past, 99490, is gone. So let's just take a brief look at the new codes, GO511 or GO512. Because in addition to either chronic care management, which we've been used to, and general behavioral health integration, there are some higher level services when you're involving a care team which involves a psychiatric consultant, a mental health professional, and a medical provider operating together to coordinate care on a monthly basis of those patients that are receiving likely high intensity coordination services in addition to the face-to-face -face services we provide. So notice at the bottom the list of, C, uh, of CPT and HCPCS codes that were deleted from the HCPCS level two code book along with the full definitions of the codes at the very bottom. Now, we really, as a side note, uh, cannot more strongly encourage use of an AMA, or American Medical Association CPT. We recommend the professional edition because it's got pictures and a lot of good uh, reference uh, access points for you. Um, you can pick any publisher's HCPCS Level 2 code book. We have a couple on our webpage, and of course other uh, publishers do as well, uh, but you don't need to be as brand specific with your HCPCS Level 2 code book. So here we have a little information on this slide about GO511, and then we'll move on here in a moment to the psychiatric collaborative care services. But for a moment, I'd like to stick with GO511 that is a code established this year uh, that identifies that a patient is getting or has two or more chronic conditions expected to last at least 12 months or until they pass and or that's what's new this year, any behavioral or psychiatric condition being treated to include substance abuse. This same code is for either the traditional chronic care management we've been used to or psychiatric or behavioral health integration services. Make sure that you've had an initiating visit with that patient, a covered evaluation and management service, annual wellness visit or an initial preventive physical exam in the previous one year prior to your first month of reporting code G0511. It's recommended and encouraged that you make sure you get their consent that you will be their chronic care manager. So if you've been used to prior to 2018 reporting chronic care management, essentially all that's updated is you have a new G code instead of the CPT code. 
But please recognize for those of you involved in substance abuse care and psychiatric and behavioral care, that this code is opened up now for you as well if you're essentially meeting the same threshold. In our billing webinars with our certification course, you're gonna get way more information in terms of revenue codes and the hows and whens of this code. We wanted to make sure you knew what it was, what the source information was, and then a little visual here on that third concept of a psychiatric collaborative care service where either you as the treating or billing practitioner uh, is going to work in coordination with the behavioral health care manager and even potentially off-site psychiatric consultant uh, in order to provide a close and tight-knit coordination of medications and treatment plans for those receiving both medical care and psychiatric or behavioral health services. So that new phrase of psychiatric collaborative care services is gonna take place. And here are three new CPT codes uh, that you might need to be aware from this uh, from a commercial insurance concept. This is not just unique for Medicare. So here's something that we hinted at a little while ago. There are CPT codes for this psychiatric collaborative care model, however, those are ones you might be using with commercial insurance or even possibly Medicaid because please look at the bottom where it references you to Medicare wanting the new G0512 code. So we now have shown another difference between proper coding, proper documentation, and billing. So documentation requirements and elements for Medicare and GO512 here, very similar to what you saw for chronic care management and behavioral health integration in terms of needing an initiating visit, recommended to get the patient's consent, effective this year, but you'll notice the time thresholds are changed here a little bit in terms of 70 minutes the first calendar month and 60 minutes for subsequent months. And so the documentation issues and resources there at the very bottom for those of you in mental health are obviously vital to review. Make sure to integrate into your existing clinical policies and your existing um, workflow policies in terms of how you capture documentation and report a code and then recognize that one code might go to commercial insurance companies these CPT codes, whereas Medicare wants a G code. That can be understandably confusing for a provider and a biller alike. Now, because there are going to be understandable questions from those kind of technical Medicare documents, I would like to applaud CMS in November for coming up with this frequently asked questions document that outlines each of the services that we've talked about. And if you'll bear with me a moment so I can uh, go take a look at it, I wanna show you this document and uh, you know really how uh, full and complete it is and how much it's gonna cover what you're looking for. Here are the last documents we referenced. And then here is the frequently asked questions document. Notice it's about 15 pages uh, there at the very top. So it's broken down very nicely between general care management services, and that's the broad umbrella of everything we've talked about. And then each of those kind of concepts as far as behavioral health integration, care management services, and it's just really nicely laid out. What I've wanted to do for you, however, in this presentation is give you access to the highlights and the areas you might wanna go review in more detail. So highlights from that same document include the following four services only billed once per calendar month. In the past, prior to 18, you could almost have different start and end dates depending upon when you started care management could have been on the 12th of the month all the way to the 12th of the month. Please notice important for 2018 that this is per calendar month, not just every 30 days. So they do wanna make sure to see uh, that on the claim. Here's the four types that we mentioned. And then you get access to questions and answers that are gonna highlight a little bit about um, you know, how are we going to report these? So, for example, question 17, uh, can we be paid for these services in addition to a regular established visit? And it says yes on question 17. It can be billed on the same claim and both should be paid. I like that better than will. 
18. If a rural health clinic submits a claim for a billable visit and this care management service, would the total payment be subject to the RHC payment limit? And it's confirming for you there, just like it is in question 19 for FQHCs, whether or not there's a distinction in reporting these transitional care services or behavioral health or care management there using revenue code 052 and whether it's 80% of a charge or of a billable amount or of a per diem rate different for rural health or FQHCs. Notice the date of service that should be used on the claim form should be the date where the requirements to build the service have been met. In other words, that last date within that calendar month where you got to that threshold and did not provide any additional services. So for January, if I completed my 25th minute, meaning I've met the minimum threshold and I didn't do any other care management services the rest of the month, then the 20th is going to be my billing and reporting date. So, you know, we've provided you with some updates in these documents, but it's going to be ultimately your responsibility to find when these documents come out by going to Medicare's website and actively, I mean, every other week, uh, going to look at either the Rural Health Clinic page or the FQHC page. Uh, you can sign up to receive some of these updates uh, when they come out. I have found it best to go individually and review each of these individual pages. Matter of fact, I even put it on my, my work calendar. Uh, about every two, three weeks, uh, I stay, go look at Rural Health, go look at FQHC website for Medicare to see if any updates have been added. And you'll see on their site, a couple of the highlights about what we're talking about for 18 are there as well. So quick little overview of the 2018 CPT updates. There were 11 total changes in the evaluation and management section. And I tell you what, for my time, I've had 24 years in this industry, uh, primarily teaching documentation and coding and billing in 46 different states. When the new CPTs came out, I had to learn it cover to cover. That's the wonderful thing about rural and community health folks is there are really only a few key sections you need to place your focus on. So the annual updates aren't as tricky when you only have to focus on a few key sections. So you'll notice there were five new evaluation and management codes in 2018. And then a reminder that just because there's a CPT code, you gotta go double check and see if there's a HCPCS code, excuse me, HCPCS level two code that is mirroring or saying something similar. And again, there could be a difference between proper coding and proper billing. Uh, as far as the deleted codes, not a big impact on you. And if you ever do provide services in an observation uh, uh, setting there, uh, they really just added the words outpatient hospital in the evaluation management codes that report uh, observation services, the discharge services 99217, then the initial observation care uh, uh, and subsequent observation care. They just really revised that. So not a big monster change there uh, for evaluation management codes. Um, we've talked briefly on chronic care management, behavioral health integration, psychiatric collaborative care management, the fourth category of the care management umbrella, traditional or transitional care management. So it goes back to the effective date of these. These are not new. There's a, a, an additional frequently asked questions document should you need to get into more detail here. In transitional care management, notice it says at the very bottom, while FQHCs and rural health clinics are not paid separately by Medicare under the physician fee schedule, the face-to-face -face component of a transitional care management service, again, after a patient's been discharged from a hospital, could qualify as a billable visit in an FQHC or an RHC. So please make sure you're aware of these codes. The CPT codes have not necessarily changed. How and when you use them is gonna be what's important. And you know we have a full class that my colleague John Burns teaches on CPT changes where we go through the entire CPT and really hit those highlights, especially for those small rural hospitals that are doing a lot more in-depth services, whether it's uh, patient and caregiver training, for uh, international normalization, normalized ratios, uh, uh, and you know some of the billing guidance down here. But always refer, please, to Appendix B in your CPT 
for a listing of all the codes that were added, revised, or changed. And so if you compare your production report, all of the services we provide in 2017, and go look those codes up in Appendix B of the 2018 CPT, you can find out if there were new codes or revised parts of that definition as we've highlighted a couple here. Um, and then what's very important to notice, for example, on this very bottom circle is sometimes the code number is the same as it was last year. Sometimes the code uh, definition is the same as it was last year, but they might, they being the AMA, they might add text before the definition of the code or even after the code that highlights what may and may not be reported in addition to it. So it may not be an updated code, but the documentation guidance may be updated. For example, these ideas of what can and can't be reported in addition to this uh, INR code is gonna be very important for the biller and for the coder, uh, but we wanna make sure that providers are aware of these types of notes as well in order to help them gain more knowledge on how they capture their services. And so briefly, I wanna point and draw the attention to a section of the CPT that I really hope everybody in 2018 becomes uh, very intimately familiar with. Some of you may already be using these. Some of you have heard about them. Uh, but as of now, many rural and community health clinics have not been forced or required to report what are called CPT category two codes. It's easy to confuse the HCPCS level two code book with CPT category two codes. So please remember that as far as HCPCS is concerned, HCPCS stands for the Healthcare's Common Procedural Coding System. Well folks, the CPT is HCPCS level one. This is HCPCS level two. But if you're going to the back of the CPT, after all of your CPT codes are listed, there's gonna be a section that has codes with alphanumeric characters inside of them referred to as category two codes. And the text here at the beginning is gonna be important to increasing your knowledge on these codes that are used to report quality measurements. For those that are involved in Medicaid, uh, uh, incentive programs to report pay for performance or uh, utilization review nurses who are extracting this data after the service just simply to identify to an insurance company that we measured the patient's BMI or that we assessed smoking exposure and things like that. These are not services that are used as a substitute for the procedure codes we report to get paid. These are supplemental optional codes used to report quality management services. And that's kind of what you see down in the first two main paragraphs. And as a reminder there at the bottom, of course, remember the CPT is a registered trademark and copyright of the AMA. So the text that I think is most important from those first couple paragraphs, I've left you here, supplemental tracking codes used for performance measurement. And they might just facilitate data collection, which is why Medicaid organizations really like this because they'll sometimes provide you incentive money to report this quality data. Traditional fee-for-service offices may already be at a point with some of their managed care organizations where they have to report this or their reimbursement might go down. Rural and community health, we're working our way into this and I need you to be aware of these codes at the back of the CPT for 2018 because quality as defined differently by many different folks can be measured by providing these CPT category two codes and accurate diagnostic codes from the ICD-10 CM book. So notice again, the, I'm using quote marks here, the use of these codes is optional and not required for correct coding. And these are the types of things that may typically be included in an E&M service. Whether you're, uh, in addition to what you've done and why you've done it, you might be able to use these codes that end with the letter F to report the results of lab studies and to track A1C levels and to see how BMI is going up or down and is really used as data by a lot of these carriers. And so there is a, a nice cross-reference that Medicare, excuse me, that the AMA gives on their website that will allow you to fully review any measures related to specific disease, 
uh, uh, processes uh, that's beyond our scope today, but please make sure you're able to go out there and find out uh, which carriers might want them. What I've done here is broken out those sections for you and given you a star next to the ones you might want to peek more individually through um, in order to identify uh, the patient history or physical exam items or even kind of a composite of, mo of uh, a few of these. So here are some highlights of codes we see particularly through community health or FQHC organizations. Simply to identify that you assessed heart failure or that uh, you know this patient is a part of a community acquired bacterial pneumonia assessment and these composite measures have individual little measures over here that should not be reported separately but should be used the using the composite or combination code and so whether it's tobacco use or pain severity being assessed um, you know, with the opioid, uh, opioid excuse me, crisis happening now, I think you'll see more state organizations, maybe even county organizations, wanting to know how often certain pain severity scales are being measured for patients and whether pain is present or not to compare that to uh, prescription levels and, and how often uh, prescriptions are being written for kind of a high risk uh, opioids and, and, and other medications. Uh, whether it's that you performed a physical exam, measured BMI, or wanted to report, uh, you know, the most recent LDL levels, uh, this is how you can do it. And if you have not been asked yet to report these, don't be surprised by the end of the year when you're going to be encouraged or maybe voluntold internally by your organization to capture this or that a Medicaid insurance company or commercial carrier might want them as well. So I've given you these highlights. Take a look at these when you get a chance, and then grab your HCPCS Level 2 code book. Double check and see if your publisher gives you the equivalent of Appendix B from the CPT that outlines which codes have changed, been deleted, or have had their definitions revised, in particular for the ones highlighted here in red. Uh, some G-code updates this year big time, not only related to the care management discussion, uh, we kind of highlighted there a while ago, uh, but even some modifiers uh, uh, that are going to apply. And J-codes, these J-codes, your injectable drugs, they change units on your J-codes often and it's very difficult to keep up with them. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising that your software vendor automatically uploads these new code definitions into your system. My question is, does that transition itself to your encounter form, or what you might call your super bill for your providers? Um, if I, if the, the definition of that injectable drug last year was per 20 cc's, but they updated it to per 40 cc's, are we still reporting at times two? We might now be getting paid twice as much or I should say capturing the costs of twice as much as we should, or maybe the opposite. They reduced the dosage and we should be reporting more units. Big time impact in fee for service reimbursement for commercial carriers, and also maybe in your cost reports for certain uh, drugs and, and vaccines and sort. Of course, Medicaid has their own section in your HCPCS Level 2 codebook. See if your carrier is requiring any more of those. We'll give you a couple highlights here. These are codes that look very similar and almost you know, match some other definitions in the CPT and HCPCS Level 2 codebook, but you should be aware that these are traditionally Medicaid only if they begin with the letter T, and they might replace for Medicaid things like the 99211 code for what we traditionally refer to as that nurse visit. So whether it's a 2018 new code or revised code or things we just think you need to keep your eye on this year, hopefully this is helping. So as we mentioned before, there are a couple uh, differences with traditional publishers' versions of the books, but in particular, I'd encourage you to go review modifiers Q5 and Q6. Q5 was traditionally and for, geez, decades defined as a service being provided by a substitute physician under a reciprocal agreement. So for example, very common in a rural or community health setting where I might be covering for another clinic, there are only two providers in town. But if I'm on vacation, maybe they cover my patients and vice versa, whether it's in a, uh, uh, an emergency setting or on a traditional you know, ongoing acute or chronic illness visit. 
but maybe I'm not credentialed with the same carriers they are or vice versa. And this is a very, very infrequent uh, uh, time where I see their patients and they bill for it. Or they see my patients and they bill for it because we cover for each other. Uh, the definition of Q5 has been updated for 2018 to read, service furnished under a reciprocal billing arrangement by a substitute physician, and it says, or substitute physical therapist doing outpatient therapy. We can kind of ignore that part. It says, by a, uh, in a health professional shortage area, a medically underserved area, or a rural area. Well, folks, that is written for us now. So if you're getting paid for services uh, that another provider did while they're covering for you, it's always been a question on how in the world do I get credentialed so quickly and it's just gonna be five patients a year, modifier Q5 is there for you. Q6 was updated this year. Its definition was revised to, revised to also add the words, service furnished under a fee for time compensation agreement by a substitute provider, kind of summarizing there, in a health professional shortage area, medically underserved area, or a rural area. Well, folks, those are community health and rural health clinics when you're typically and likely using the services of a locum tenens who was not doing their own billing. So be aware of Q5 and Q6. Those are the major modifiers that were updated that are relevant to you in rural and community health. Of course, the bottom, we looked at the G codes there, and very important, I, I just can't uh, emphasize enough, uh, to update and see if the dosages for your injectable drugs, whether it's Depo, B12, Rocephin, Synvis, Kyalgin, the dosages change, okay? Uh, so, you know, when we're in our traditional classes here to kind of work our way to ICD-10 coding and get you out of here for uh, your 2008 booster pack updates, you know, uh, finding a code in the HCPCS book doesn't always mean that we're going to report it on a claim. There might be things that are going to go on your cost report. And that's important when we're doing our, our, our full training on site or our full online training is that we recognize we don't just get paid in a rural and community health setting with our per diem rates. Sometimes we bill fee for service. Sometimes what we do is never gonna get reported on a claim form, but is captured internally, as you see on the bottom, for what's gonna be captured uh, at the end of the year, end of our fiscal year, in what's called the annual cost report. So we're only doing a quick little you know, hour long update here, but please make sure you're aware of any new codes and being able to go back and review for Medicare and find out is it a valid FQHC or rural health claim where we're gonna get our per diem rate? Is it something we bill fee for service? Does that change coinsurance or deductible with the patient? Could that be different with commercial insurance than Medicare? And then lastly, what about these services that we're not gonna put on a claim form to Medicare? We're not gonna get paid fee for service, but are captured on our cost report. So we know there's a lot of ongoing education for those of you that are maybe new to the rural and community health side. And those are very, very interesting concepts to those of you uh, that were maybe trained in the traditional medical world, but not on the unique coding and billing variations in our typical underserved areas. So as we move to, and last but not least here, of course, our ICD-10-CM changes, uh, please recognize that most of the changes we've been talking about are in effect January 1 of 2018. But of course, as you see down here, uh, those new ICD-10 codes and concepts are updated every October 1st of each year. What I'd like you to do is make sure that you go into your physical ICD-10 book because nothing substitutes for having the actual code books with you. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of text in your CPTs, for example, before codes that talk about general behavioral management services or advanced care planning or transitional care services. Just a ton of information here that the AMA does not license to software providers. Same thing with your ICD-10 books. There's a lot of information here in the code books, and I know you can't really see it there, but there's a lot of information that appears before codes that talks about codes you can bill or cannot report in addition to a certain ICD-10 code. Even if the code is the same definition it's been 
since ICD-10 came out. There's some text up there by your base code that talks about code also the underlying condition or code first the underlying condition. Um, heck, there are even guidelines at the beginning of the book, which is what I'm encouraging you to find, that are referred to as the official guidelines for coding and reporting. So I urge you to go to your manual, regardless of which publisher's manual you get, make sure you have the 2018 version, but when you go look at the official guidelines, please do not be surprised when you find the previous year's guidelines. You see, these are the, the rules to the road. It's about 40 or 50 pages that tells you how to locate proper codes and how to report them together. Heck, it even goes in and explains what the word and means. Um, and bottom line, there's a little surprise, and in the ICD-10 actually means and, or, or. But if you never read the guidelines, you may not know that. You may misinterpret the definition of a code, understandably, by not understanding the guidelines. So the reason I'd like some of you to go make sure you have the current year's guidelines is, is oftentimes publishers send the new year's book out, but the guidelines haven't been updated yet. So see which guidelines you have, please, and notice whether the changes appear in bold text, things that are underlined have been moved, and whether italics identify any heading changes. So I really uh, want to talk and teach always more ICD-10 coding. It's just, it's just vital. But what I've done up here is put on the list for you before I give you the uh, kind of the updates to the 2018 guidelines. What didn't change with the ICD-10? These same guidelines really have been in effect for the ICD-9 for the you know when it was in effect for almost 40 years, as in the ICD-10CM. Whether it's code for the reason for that visit first, and then list additional coexisting conditions that affected care on that visit. Making sure that you're not coding probable or suspected or questionable or ruled out diagnoses as your hospitals often do, but not for a rural health provider, not for a community health provider. And so the educational piece here for providers just could not be more important. And the source for almost each and every one of these is at the beginning of your ICD-10 book. And that's what I wanna focus on in terms of the updates. By the way, we do have a webinar. It's, it's um, I think it's about an hour long on the 2000 changes uh, that are a little bit more specific uh, to some of the codes here. But our focus here is going to be on confirming for you that they literally update and spend a good bit of time talking about what the word with means. So for example here, the definition they give of acute organ dysfunction that is not clearly associated with that sepsis, meaning whether the word with or in is inside the definition as of 2018 means associated with or due to. So you might wanna pull up your most common diagnosis codes, literally do a keyword search to see if you find the word with, go speak with the providers and see if they're defining the word with as due to, or are they specifically just saying they both happen to exist together. And so whether those conditions are coded as being related or unrelated might change the code you pick. But hey, we realize that when you're busy, you're seeing patients, it's very easy to go look up a diagnosis code with a keyword search, scroll through that list, and what I've had providers kind of say off the record to me is, hey, I picked something that's close, because I'm busy, I've gotta, I've gotta get done. Our focus for our organization is on helping the clinical folks and the billing folks make sure that the diagnosis we provide is based on the exact rules and is the exact condition the patient has because ultimately, forget about billing, patients have the right to understand the diagnoses they have very accurately, whether they're paying for their services or not, or irrespective of the insurance they have. So without going word for word, I want you to see that what they've done is they've clarified on various pages what words like code also mean. If you see code also, it says that two codes may be required to fully describe a condition, but the note does not provide sequencing direction. 
So, uh, you know, an example of a code also note are all your asthma codes. In the, in the ICD-10 state, code also smoking exposure. Now, I haven't seen any carriers yet deny a claim with asthma as a diagnosis if you did not, quote, code also the smoking exposure. But don't be surprised if that happens. Carriers have had a long time, and they would not necessarily themselves say, hey, look, it's not that we're denying it. It's that the ICD-10 might require it. And so understanding each of these notes is going to be important. And in particular, when you get to section C, that's a typo, my mistake, section C in those guidelines, chapter four, if you want to see what specific updates or just clarifications there are for each of the 21 chapters of the ICD-10, this is what you're going to see. So for those of you that are, have taken our hierarchical coding conditions course or are getting into value-based payments, uh, quality measurement, things like that, where we talked about those category two per, you know, CPT codes, making sure that we're painting the most clear picture of the patient's condition is important. And what the ICD-10 has done this year in 2018 is reminded us for diabetes that there might be a supplemental code from the base code section Z79 that will help identify that the patient is a, in this case, long-term user of insulin. Depending upon which code it is in the category Z79 that's used as a supplemental diagnosis, it might be that they're a high-risk user, or a long-term, excuse me, or current user of a high-risk medication, anticoagulants, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, et cetera. And what that's truly gonna do is help you show the risk of that individual patient compared to others who may not also be long-term or current users of high-risk meds. So whether it's confirmation or clarification on substance abuse codes that have happened over the last couple of years in terms of the difference between substance use versus substance abuse or substance dependence. A lot of these clarifications in the ICD-10 that they're made in 2018 are really there so your clinicians can have discussions on uh, um, confirming that their clinical definitions match the code definitions. Because again, I can search in a keyword index for anything and I can click on that diagnosis, but that doesn't mean that my documentation is that uh, supporting that exactly. Uh, in the medical record, and of course, that's going to be our primary goal with ICD-10. So if it's these chapter-specific guidelines, whether it's a chapter 9 for hypertension and MIs, if it's chapter 4 for endocrine, it's really mostly clarification of how codes are used, not that there was a tremendous amount of codes themselves that were updated. So what we focus on in the educational process is not, hey, let's go memorize and find out our top 10 codes and try to get everybody to fit to our favorites list, but let's make sure that when we're looking for codes, we're aware of subtle differences and nuances, such as the word and, or with, or code also, that are gonna be most important. So whether you're doing MIs or you're, you're reporting non-pressure uh, chronic ulcers because you're in a rural uh, maybe hospital setting, etc., that section C in those guidelines is going to be ultimately vital. But when you get to the last of the 21 chapters of the ICD-10 in those guidelines, I want you to stop and take a look at your, your Z code section. Because rural and community health, we live on these Z codes. These are uh, what used to be called V codes and typically asymptomatic reasons you're seeing your patients. And there's always been this misunderstanding in the coding and billing world that, well, geez, you can't use these as primary diagnosis codes. Well, sure you can. So one of the things the guidelines do nicely for you is they confirm in writing things that some of you already knew, but if a provider or a colleague uh, uh, you know, asks you to show that, where is that in writing? It was always difficult to locate. And so when you get a chance to look through these Z codes, of course, ICD-10 coding, for example, got a lot easier for vaccinations. We have one Z23 code as opposed to about 36 different V codes in the old ICD-9. And there's about six or seven pages that goes through all of these most common codes for general health, general medical exams, newborn and routine children checks, or annual GYN encounters 
that are used with our preventive medicine services. Because in our full training, we're very careful to distinguish between a problem-oriented visit and a preventive visit. And if it is a well visit, do we use the annual wellness visit codes, the welcome to Medicare physical codes, or CPT codes, all of which may share the same diagnosis codes. So understand and know your Z codes well. When our full training classes occur, we go through and we review them in detail and give you nice crosswalks. And, and what we've done is highlighted the keywords that you find in the manual where the codes are listed so you don't have to. But we really think hands-on familiarity with these books continues in 2018, folks, because the day that the industry figures out how to make truly fully featured versions of these manuals is the day I'm going to stop carrying them around and I still carry them around because the books have the best information in it. Please make sure you get your books each year. Anybody out there that can convince me that you don't need manuals or copies of manuals somewhere in the office, I will send them to you for free. So last but not least, uh, uh, kind of an interesting insight that uh, uh, I just got via my email a couple days ago here is a summary for those of you more in rural health as opposed to community health, but you're, you're both mentioned here because there are federally qualified health centers or community health centers, not only in uh, high urban areas, big cities like I'm in Atlanta, but there are plenty of FQHCs and community health centers in rural areas. So the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services met and recently released this document that I really think you should be aware of. I've given you the source and a little picture there. Uh, and in particular, their recommendations include some items that may have a very positive impact on your bottom line and on your overall reimbursement that might allow you to continue to advance telehealth and telemedicine as traditional offices can. Uh, they're gonna talk about more training dollars being available to you to support value-based care. That was those category two codes and ICD-10 codes. And whether it's allowing more providers to be authorized in your underserved areas, or updating and adjusting employment rules in terms of meeting your credentialing or certification guidelines, we really think that would be excellent to look at. Um, we know this is a lot to keep track of. We've tried to get all of this into a kind of a short, uh, you know, snackable amount of time here, uh, but we can't urge you enough to recognize that we're aware there were a lot of things that I would like to go into more detail on, and that's what we do in our in-person courses and in our online courses. So if you want to check a little sneak peek out on YouTube of our online self-study certification course um, that deals with clinical documentation, professional coding, and the billing piece, which is missing from most other certifications out there, make sure you recognize that we provide the only training on coding billing and the only certification on coding and billing specific to rural health and community health centers in the country. Folks, we have a passion for what we do. Uh, there are some just really vital differences between the way traditional organizations report their services and we do. And what we've done is given you a little sneak peek of a 40 minute module that you should see mirrors this format. And we would love to come see you in your state. Let your primary care associations know that we're out there. Let your rural health associations know that we're out there. We appreciate the, the, the work we've had with those state and national rural health and national community health organizations to help get the word out, to help you learn more, to earn more. And this 40 minute little sneak peek will help give you an idea about how that course is organized, what self-study means, how you build your binders, take practice exercises, and can then listen to the billing webinars. So 11 hours of online training that you get 90 days to finish and then three hours of billing webinars followed by an optional certification exam to become either a rural health or a community health coding and billing specialist. So go take a peek at that. Like us on Facebook there. Uh, you'll always see where we're gonna show up. We'll put out news and updates there. We're continuing to advance that. I do appreciate your time. 
My name was Gary Lucas. Actually, it still is Gary Lucas. Uh, I'm proud to uh, represent the Association for Rural and Community Health Professional Coding. So on behalf of our owner, John Beard, my primary colleagues, John Burns, Julia Scott, uh, Charles James, Pat, I mean, everybody out there that we uh, work with to help support what you do, uh, because we truly believe that if you're not successful as an individual or as an organization, that has a negative impact on your community, and uh, we want to help you have a career and not just a job in healthcare. And uh, let us know if there's anything we can do to help out. I wish you a very wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much.